Here is my first key point on the management of time. Either you run the day or it runs you. That's fairly simply put, but it is so true. Everything in life is a lot like that. Emotions are a good example. Either you master them or they will master you. Something is always going to master and something is always going to serve. Whether it's your emotions, your enterprise, or your project. Difficulty will serve or master. Fear, anxiety, inclinations. They all serve or master. We must learn to send our inclinations to school to teach them how to behave, how best to serve, and to learn their true value. So that is key one. Get in charge. You be the master. It pays to take a look often and examine all the parts of your life and all the things that you are involved in and all the things that are affecting you so that you can get an intelligent answer to the question who's in charge here? It's so easy when you get something started to unwittingly relinquish the reins of authority so that it begins to subtly but surely take over. Soon you become the servant. It dictates. It demands. And you respond. So let's turn this whole challenge around. You take over the reins of authority. You subtly but surely take charge. You dictate. You demand. And you will be delighted to see early signs of positive response from your enterprise, your business, and your life. The next time management essential is to learn to say no. I had some difficulty here. It is so easy to say yes to everything trying to be a nice person and then have to spend all that time trying to come up with excuses to get out of the obligation. It's one of the great time wasters. How much better to say, no, I don't think I can, but if that changes, I'll give you a call. And isn't it a better feeling to call someone with the good news, I can come, than with the bad news, guess what, I can't come. When in doubt, learn to say no. A friend of mine, Ron Reynolds, has a good saying, don't let your mouth overload your back. That's a great thought to keep in mind when scheduling your time. Here's the next tip. When you work, work, and when you play, play. For time efficiency, and for that good feeling that comes from doing something without any guilt feeling, don't mix the two. Many years ago, I used to say, I've got to get my family to the beach. I've been promising to take them to the beach. What are they going to think if I don't take them? Now guess where I am while I'm thinking about the beach? Right, at the office. Now I finally get my family to the beach, but at the beach I'm saying, I should be at the office. I have so much to do. Now I've messed up my beach time with the family by thinking about the office. So I learned this lesson. Make a play day a play day and a work day, a work day. Don't mix the two. Sure enough, if you say I'm going to take off at three o'clock and go play, guess what you are thinking about all morning? Taking off to go play. So don't play at work and don't work at play. It's a great rule to follow to ensure that your time is used more effectively. Now I know all of this has to be modified to fit your particular situation. No one rule will apply to all. But keep the main thought in mind, separate work and play. When I take a lecture tour to Spain or Africa or Australia, I make it a work trip. Every day is filled with lectures, speeches and business conferences. Then I arrange a play trip, because when I play, I really want to play. A builder friend of mine now has the luxury of working a week and taking off a week. That's what he calls it, work a week, play a week. However, with weekends on either side of his play week, it's really nine days. So he works five and takes off nine. That is luxury, right? However, the five days he works, he really works. Secretaries, accountants, architects, superintendents, long days around the clock into the night, five heavy full days. Then he's off to play. So when he works, he really works so that he can save all the playtime for a longer stretch. Now perhaps we can't all do that, but we can learn to practice the skill of separating work and play.
next time management essential is to analyze how you are. Then if the challenge calls for it, you must either change how you are or change your procedure. That is productivity waiting to make time pay. Self-analyzing. The first thing to analyze is your periods of greatest productivity throughout the day. If you are a morning person who wakes up early, ready to start the day, that is the best time to do your creative work. You can get more done when you're at your best. Some people are night people, fuzzy in the morning, late to get started, but alert and awake long into the evening. If that's the way you are, then this is the best time to pack in the activity and creativity. The key is to find your best time and use it to its fullest. Next, analyze your habits. If, for example, you're not good at keeping records, get someone to do it for you. If you have promised yourself that you're going to keep your records or balance your checkbook, and this has been going on for a few years, it looks like you aren't that kind of person. Nor are you likely to become that kind of person. You may say, no, I'm really going to do it this time. Hey, I would suggest that a few years is long enough. Don't promise yourself anymore. Just say, maybe the smart thing to do is to get someone to do this and make me look good. You would be surprised at how often you can remain a lot like you are in many areas if you will just make the arrangements to have it covered. Some years ago, my office came to the conclusion that I was a poor courier. Someone would ask me to take a check to San Francisco since I was going there anyway. I would say, sure, no problem. Put the check in my pocket and fly off to San Francisco. Guess when I would next hear about that check? From my dry cleaners. Next time someone says, this document has to go to New York. Will you be sure to give it to them this time? I'd say, of course, you can count on me this time. I'm not flaky. So I put the document in my briefcase and head off for New York. Guess what? Right, it would still be in my briefcase when I got back to the office the following week. So there is a saying now in my office, don't give the chairman anything. He's good at some things, but he's a poor courier. Make other arrangements. And that is my point. There is nothing wrong with admitting that you just aren't going to do certain things as long as you are clever enough to make arrangements to have them done. It's much better than continually promising that you will when the chances are good that you won't. Next time management essential, the telephone. What an incredible instrument for business, social and emergency situations. The job it can do for you is unbelievable. However, there are some tips for using the telephone so that it won't use you. Here's the first one. Before you make a call, make an agenda. An agenda is simply a list of the items you want to talk about, especially if it's a business call. It is one of the better habits to develop. Did you ever make a call and toward the end of the conversation say, let's see, there was something else I was going to talk to you about. I just can't think of it right now, but if I think of it later, I'll call you back. A great time waster. And for a business call, not very sophisticated on your part. Making an agenda before you make a call serves to keep your conversation on course so that you cover the essentials without missing any of them. Also, it helps to keep the conversation on track and control the tendency to wander into non-essential chit-chat. It is also a money saver. The extra minutes saved by keeping to an agenda and a few pleasantries is major. I know. My business telephone bill just in California got up to $13,000 a month. And this was one of the problems. Doing business internationally, we have learned the incredible savings of both time and money by taking the time to write down an agenda before we begin to dial. And here's another benefit. If you have made an agenda, when it comes time to recall that conversation you had, you've now got the details in writing. When you say, John, how are you doing on those four things we talked about the other day? And John says, what four things? We didn't talk about that. You now have a written record to show that you did. Remember, people can talk you out of what's in your head, but it's hard to talk you out of what's in your book. 
Next, if you can afford the luxury, have your calls screened. Then when you pick up the messages, you can decide who to call and when to call. And have the time to formulate the important information before you make the call. Now, this is a luxury, I will admit. It may be that you just have to answer the phone when the call comes in. But at least file this idea away for the future, when you might be able to use it. And one more, the telephone at home. Here you have to exercise great care to not let the telephone intrude. During social time with family or friends, my suggestion is that you shut the phone off. They have all those neat devices now, so you can. Put on the recorder to take messages or just pull the plug. Family is a high priority. Take care that valuable family time is not subject to frequent intrusions. If you set up this rule, you will not only have uninterrupted time with your family and friends, but also they will give you high marks for caring about them enough to make them a priority. Every situation calls for an evaluation of values. You've just got to weigh everything and make the necessary adjustments if you want to get full time and full value out of your life. The next time management tip I have is to listen to the cassette programs and read the books on the subject. You can't possibly get all the ideas you'll need from any one cassette program or person. Remember, you have to go in search of the ideas. They don't just come by. Make a thorough investigation of the subject on your own. Sort out the ideas. Choose those that you think are most valid and put them to work in your life. Next point, be more alert and analyze all your procedures and tools. Old filing methods, old bookkeeping methods. Some things we do can become quickly outdated, especially these days. Check for all the new tools that can help you to use your time more efficiently. Dictating machines, tape recorders, answering devices, computers, calculators. There is just about every tool imaginable in today's marketplace. I now have a fabulous computer in my office that can do the most amazing things and save a great deal of time. I also have a portable computer typewriter that I can take on an airplane or in my motorhome. Then I merely transfer what I have typed onto special cassettes or send the information via telephone back to the main terminal. When I get home, all of my letters and scripts are typed and waiting for my signature or my attention. So take a look, do some research, do some shopping, find out. No telling how much you can improve your efficiency or multiply your skills by eliminating the barriers and the hindrances so that you are now free to do all the creative things that make for fortune and lifestyle. Now here's an important time saver. Learn to ask questions. This habit will serve in so many ways. Have you ever talked to someone for an hour and then asked some questions and found out that you just wasted the last hour? Make a note. Almost everything is symptomatic of what's really wrong. Surface details don't usually give us enough information to effectively communicate. So, ask questions before. If John isn't making sales, we say, okay, let's get on him about making sales. But perhaps we should ask, why isn't he making sales? Someone says, he isn't making enough calls. We say, okay, let's get on him about making calls. Well, maybe we should ask another question first. Why isn't he making calls? Well, it's because he isn't getting up early and getting out into the marketplace. We say, okay, let's get on him about getting up early and getting out into the marketplace. Well, perhaps we should ask just one more question. Why isn't he getting up early and getting out into the marketplace? Now we have probably gotten to the heart of the problem. Perhaps it's something personal, problems at home, not his sales skills. The real problems are usually about three or four questions deep. So if you get good at asking questions, you can save yourself a lot of time by getting right at the heart of the matter when dealing with other people. Otherwise, you tend to waste valuable time just finding out what the problem really is. 
Now here is the last part of time management. Learn to think on paper. From all of my experience working on many projects and in many countries, one of the major time savers is thinking on paper. It is so important to take things out of your head and put them on paper, then work from the paper. Building your business is a lot like building a house. You take the ideas out of your head, put them on paper, and then build from the plan. We have a saying on this idea, operate from document, not from thought. It's just about over when a person wakes up in the morning and says, let's see, what shall I do today? Too late, right? The best thing you can do now is to take today off and at least plan tomorrow. Let me give you four major ways to think on paper. The first is a journal. I spend a lot of time talking about journals in my lectures and programs primarily because it is such an invaluable tool for the serious student of the better life. A journal is merely a gathering place for all the good information that comes your way from sermons, from books, from lectures, from business conferences, magazines, thinking time, research, any source of information that you feel is worth keeping. Don't let the good ideas of life escape you. Remember, most good ideas usually only come by once. Get into the habit of capturing them with pen and paper by making daily use of your journal. Now maybe you won't write in it every day, but at least make sure it's with you every day. Here's the second way to think on paper, a projects book. This is simply a ring binder with tabs in it to help you keep track of all the current people and projects you are involved with and need to work on to make all the parts of your life work to the maximum. If you are working with people, give them each a tab in your projects book. Then under this tab, you keep a running account of all the current information you need to know about that person. Performance, family, goals, strengths, needs, perhaps even some graphs showing recent progress or comparisons to past performance. Essentially, you make a note of all the information you need to know so that when you sit down to have a meeting with this person, you have all the pertinent facts there before you in order to have a meaningful and productive conversation. Without this habit, it's so easy to take up time talking with someone and get so very little accomplished because most of the meeting ends up by being devoted to bringing you up to date on the facts you could have already had in your projects book. Now, depending on your particular business or enterprise, you might want to have a tab for each office or each department or each ongoing project. On a more personal level, you might want to have a tab for each family member or for your personal projects, investments, finances, game plans, and so forth. It's just an effective way to keep all the key pieces of information readily available so you won't have to be continuously hunting through files and drawers for the data. It is the best way I know of to study your business and life projects. A projects book is a guideline for this study. We simply don't study files. They are for storing information. The projects book is for the daily or weekly summary accounting of all the pieces. Like a financial statement of your business at the end of the month. In fact, that is one of the sections in your projects book. And another secret. With a guideline to study, it keeps you on good mental track. If you try to study your business and your life in your head, you will for sure miss something, miscalculate, or let your mind go undisciplined in those high thought areas where the ideas and plans and inspiration for fortune lie. It's the organized, better disciplined thought that produces abundance. Everyone is thinking but mostly about how to get by. I'm asking you to develop these tools and disciplines to think about how to become wealthy and happy, powerful and influential, sophisticated and unique. The next way to think on paper is to keep a day timer, a daily log of your list of things to do and your appointments and schedules. This is where I also keep the agenda for my telephone calls. It becomes a clear and useful record if you have a business and need to keep track of expenses for income tax purposes, your day timer should also accommodate this need. 
A daytimer is also a good place to record telephone numbers and other key information that you need on a daily basis. Basically, it's a way of keeping a record of your daily activities. Your daytimer can also be used as a gathering place for all the details or highlights from your day which need to be logged into your journal or projects book at a later time. It's just an efficient means of keeping track of your days and scheduling your projects and appointments. I strongly recommend that you develop the daytimer habit. It only takes a few minutes a day to keep your records up to date and the time and information you save by using one is massive. Now here's the fourth way to think on paper. The all-important game plan. A game plan can make all the difference in the world in how your months and years work out for you in terms of both accomplishment and satisfaction. Whether you do business at home, down the street, within the community, or around the world, game plans are essential for maximizing productivity. Here's a phrase worth remembering, and that is, don't start the day until you have it finished. That idea is worth the money. A plan before you start. A day is a major piece of the whole strategy of your wealth plan, your success plan. I know it is laborious, but it's labor and effort that pays in cash and accomplishment. And remember, value is on the other side of effort, not hope. Now if you want to make a lot more progress and income, here's the key. Don't start the week until you have it finished. Of course it is more challenging to finish a week than to finish a day, but the pay and the results are so exciting, you won't mind the challenge. And if you want to make a lot of money and big success, don't start the month until you have it finished. That one is a stretch, but high in reward. Now if you want to start walking among the heavyweights, here's the key. Don't start the year until you have it finished. I don't want to kid you, this one is difficult. It's reserved for those few who do and become the superstars in accomplishment, enterprise, wealth, influence, and lifestyle. It's a high road of sophisticated disciplines, but I'm positive you will like the view and the taste and the company. A game plan is merely a spreadsheet for your activities. It can be a game plan for a day, a week, a month, a year, several months, or several years. And a game plan can be for a single project or for a variety of concurrent projects. Here's how it works. On a sheet of graph paper, you make vertical columns for the weeks or months that this plan is to cover. Then, on the left side of the paper, you make a heading called activities. Under this heading, you list all of the activities to be performed within that time frame. Let's say that part of your business requires providing ongoing training programs for your employees. Under the column marked activities, you merely list the various training programs you wish to conduct for the next 12 months. Then under the vertical columns for each month, you block off particular periods of time for these training classes. Game plans can be used to help you plan almost any aspect of your business or enterprise. They can also be used to help you organize all areas of your life from investment plans to reading plans. Game plans are particularly useful when it comes to scheduling family time, vacations, special weekends and trips, and so forth. Everyone who is important to you wants to see where he or she is on your game plan, especially if your business often requires you to spend a lot of time away from home. And remember, there's nothing like a visual plan. It's so much more effective to be able to show members of your family where they are on your game plan as opposed to merely telling them in conversation. Now a game plan can be as detailed as you wish and please be forewarned now that you are probably going to tear up several before you get what you want. This is something you have to work with. Every game plan must be tailored to fit a particular need. The chart you use for your personal plans may not necessarily be suitable as a chart for your business plans. Here is another key benefit of using game plans. If you have your plan in your projects book or up on a wall somewhere, it serves as a constant reminder to get busy on all the activities you have scheduled. Or 
If there are a lot of blank holes beside the activities you have listed, your plan reminds you to get busy scheduling them. Now you might well ask, doesn't a calendar do the same thing? Not really. Many of the events on your game plan will be on your calendar, but here are the major differences. First, the visual reminder of the spreadsheet and the list of activities on the left that have no corresponding time assigned to them on the right serve to remind you of what is not yet done. A calendar just won't give you that kind of information. And second, it is so important to take a look at three months, six months, one year at a time for highly effective planning. With a game plan, you can get a sense of the whole picture of the time frame and all of the important activities at one look. To effectively design something, you just have to have a picture of the whole finished project, complete or as complete as possible. Game plans are both exciting and painful. Painful because of all the things you must get on with and plan, make up your mind about, or give serious thought to. And painful because they illustrate how far behind you are sometimes. But they are also very exciting, both because they help you to foresee how your life, your business, and your family are going to unfold over the coming months, and because they can help you get the job done. It's like looking at the artist's rendering of the finished project. It brings all kinds of feelings to the surface as we see it all take shape and unfold. And it also gives you that incredible feeling of being in charge. You have your life in hand and in order and well designed. Remember how valuable a day is. It is part of your whole life enterprise. A day is like a piece of the mosaic of your life. Fashion it wisely to the best of your genius. For as someone once said, at midnight, the winged messengers come and gather up all these pieces and take them off to wherever the mosaic is kept. And surely on occasion, one messenger says to another, wait till you see this one. A well-fashioned day with a beginning and an end, a purpose and a content, a color and a character, a feel and a texture. This well-fashioned day takes its place among the many and becomes a valuable memory and treasure. An equity of experience and spirit and light. And remember, the genius to do all this lies within you. Never forget that. Some people say, if I was as smart as you are, make sure you make the correction in thinking to say, if I had developed as much of my smart as you have. That's it. We are all smart enough. We just have to develop.